Hi ladies, I'm Terry Temple. Ladies, today we're going to do lesson 10 of this book. Join me for lesson 10. We're going to have a great time. So let's get started. we got a lot to do. We're going to be starting on page 70, 79, page 79. I'm not going to read page 79. That's inspiring proverbs and quotes. So that is the Bible. I encourage you to read that on your own, though. I encourage you to read that on your own. So we're going to start in on page 80. Now start on page 80, ladies. If you have any questions <coughs> or comments, <coughs> excuse me, because this is a live, this is a live study. If you have any questions or comment, please let me know. Please let me know. You are welcome. <coughs> excuse me. You are welcome to. There's a little sidebar. It should be right here. And you're welcome to, uh, any, as, as I'm reading through this book, just put any questions. And I'm going to be looking over this. We're going to be doing this uh, live together. If you have any questions, anything, let me know. Or just email me, whatever. Whatever you want, whatever is more convenient for you, I'm here to serve you. And that's, that's what it's about. Okay, ladies? So I'm doing my book, doing my book, the study. We're on page 80 of The Godly Woman's Guide to Inner and Outer Beauty. And uh, we're still in a lovely spirit. Essential keys to maintaining a happy home. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content, happy, satisfied. That's 1 Timothy 6, verses 8, New King James Version. A happy home most likely will not come naturally or by accident. It takes planning. Even Christians need help in this area. For we are not impervious to having dysfunctional households, even though we have God's word. Nevertheless, we all desire a dwelling where we love to hang out. Today I have a happy marriage and home, but it has not always been that way, mainly because I was raised in an unhealthy environment, as was my husband. However, with the use of these tips gained through experience, knowledge, and understanding of God's word, my home is regularly a peaceful, <clears throat> excuse me, a peaceful environment for me and for my family. Here are a few keys on how to maintain a happy home environment. I also did a study on this on my television show and it's here on my YouTube channel as well. So I encourage you to watch that if you have time or, or if you really need more encouragement in this area. The first tip is to plan ahead. Instead of moaning about undesirable circumstances, arrange moments of pleasure. For instance, if you want your husband to be more romantic, take the initiative. Plan date nights once a week and schedule out of town trips once a month, especially if you have children or other relatives living in the home. Tip number two, trust in God. Believe and be confident in Him and obey His word. A lack of trust leads to living in anxiety, worry, or fear. Remember, we are spirits residing in the flesh, and fear leads to evil spirits in the home that can transfer from one individual to another. This is not superstition, but a Bible fact. See Psalms 37, 8 through 9, Ephesians 6, 12. God desires that we walk in the spirit and not allow the flesh to control us or our bodies. And that's according to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. Page 81, the second uh, paragraph. Be quick to forgive and avoid strife, conflict, discord, rivalry. If you and your spouse do not do have a big disagreement, make sure it does not take place in front of your children or grandchildren. Go to the park to discuss the matter or wait until the children are away. <clears throat> And I say this, I wrote this because a lot of times we fight in front of our children unintentionally and it damages our children. They make them feel extremely insecure. And so, of course, we don't want our children to be insecure because it could lead to a lot of other problems in the family and in their individual lives. So this is why that I wrote that. Okay. Uh, uh, do, don't, do not, don't play favorites with your children. It may lead to jealousy and resentment among them and to a broken family, even after they become adults. Make it imperative that they learn how to cherish, support, and love one another or their siblings. So I have relatives, my, even my mom, she plays favorites and that's not good. And it has not been a blessing, uh, her playing favorites 
uh, to me and my sister, our relationship. It's not good. Me and my sister, we get along, but I think we could get along a lot better and we would have had a lot stronger uh, relationship if my mom did not play favors. So it's not good. Uh, in the Bible, uh, uh, Isaac, I believe it was not Isaac, but Jacob, he played favorites with, uh, I think, with Joseph. And I think Esau and Jacob, their mother, and and dad they played uh favorites between them between esau and jacob so and with terrible consequences so it's not good and pray about it if you if you play favorites you know pray pray up <clears throat> excuse me if you if you if you uh play favorites with your children just pray about it if you know that that's a problem for you pray about it pray about it and ask god to help you get rid of that in your life and then work on it and god will bless your efforts yes he will yes he will Pick your battles carefully. Not everything is worth arguing about, such as picking up socks and shoes off the floor. Just do it without complaint. Remember, there are more important things in life, like soul winning, helping, helping the poor, and less fortunate. And I, I believe a lot of times we just need to be reminded of what's more important in life. Because we can, we can start being nitpicky over things that, you know, yeah, it bothers us or whatever, but it's like, is it really that big of a deal to where we lose our, our temper? And then we start causing more pro problems in our home. No, it's not. You know, and so a lot of times there's even more things that are deeper problems that are going on that makes the socks on the floor or someone not uh, turning the light off when they leave the room. There's other things that make those things bother us. So we may need to pay more attention to what's going on in our lives when things bother us too much, especially little things like that. We really want to do that, okay? Communicate your feelings of displeasure immediately, but in a non-offensive manner. So communication is very important. A lot of times we wait, we don't say anything. We're like, oh, well, maybe they won't do it again. Maybe this will be the last time. I mean, we want to be patient and loving, but it's, it's important for us to, when things bother us too much or whatever, to talk about it, but in a constructive manner. Not where we're, oh, you're so stupid, you can never do anything right. You know, we don't want to We don't want to talk like that. We don't want to have that type of communication. But we want to let our loved ones know when they're doing something that's bothering us, you know. And so a lot of times a good way to do things, too, is to just ask a question, you know. And, and, and you know, like I know sometimes like with my son, uh, you know, like he doesn't help around the house as much as I would like. And so... I'll just say, you know, I, I wish you would help around the house a little bit more. Or or I'll just ask him, could you take the garbage out? Or could you clean up the kitchen? Or please clean up the kitchen instead of, you know, yelling, clean up the kitchen, quit being lazy, you bum. You know, that's, we don't want to, <laughs> that, that's not going to help. Because people don't like being called names. They don't, especially our loved ones, because they make them feel unloved. And we don't want our loved ones to feel unloved. We don't want them to feel unloved. They're our loved ones. Take care of your health. Health problems like low blood sugar and diabetes can lead to irritability and a lack of tolerance for others. So eat right and exercise. Healthy living also makes for a better love life. And I said that too. I, I mentioned this in, in my lesson from my television show on, uh, I believe, how to, some about improve the romance in your bed, how to rekindle the romance in your marriage. So I encourage you to watch that one too if you if you need the, the, the uh, fires to be uh uh, lit in your marriage. I encourage you to watch that lesson, that study. Keep your home neat and organized, even if you have to hire a maid. Being in a junky place, a junky house, or whatever, it can it can lead to you being irritable. It really can, especially for us women. Especially uh, for us women, it really can. Read and study your Bible and or a devotional book each morning, noon, and night without fail. My ebooks, Be Happy Now, and Daily Affirmations are good places to begin or end your day. Even though I author them, I find them beneficial to my spiritual well-being, so I read them regularly. So those books, I, I uh, those who subscribe to my newsletter, I'm giving away free copies of those books. They're great books, and I, uh, this ministry is nonprofit women's ministry, so I like giving things away because everybody's not rich, everybody can't afford all these things. So, but anyway, I just want to be a blessing. I just want to be a blessing. I want God to bless me, and I just want to be a blessing. And God has blessed me so greatly. 
So we need to read, we need to keep our mind on God's word. And one way to do that besides Bible study, which is very imperative, one way to do that is to keep spiritual books around your house and where you go. I keep them in my purse, in my car, in a bathroom, and I just pick them up, even if just for two to three minutes. And wow, just the spiritual boost, boost you get. And that will help keep your faith up. And when we have the more faith we have in God, the easier our lives are to live as Christians. It's never be totally easy, but easier. And that's what we want, if nothing else. Keep God center and first in your life. Plan on spending at least an hour, one day a week at the minimum in private time with God. Begin this time by reading a Bible passage or singing a Christian song. Then listen quietly to Father's Holy Spirit, which we receive at baptism within you. According to Acts chapter 2, 38, I also did a lesson. I did a lesson, I think it was through my teleconference a few years ago on a on a. I think it's called my, it's my spiritual boot camp and it helps you, encourages you how to spend private time with God. I encourage you to get that CD. It's really one of my most powerful lessons I've done here through my women's ministry. And so I encourage you to get that. It's available on my website. Schedule activities with all of your children. Even your adult children need to know you still think of them, care about them, and are proud of them. Don't assume they know. Yes, children need to be told that they, that they are loved. And, 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 and the, especially when they're young, but even, even our older children. Remember, you and your husband are on the same team. It is so easy to forget that we are on the same team. Right, married ladies? I know you know what I'm talking about. Even if you're not married and you have children, you and your children, you're on the same team. And it's good to remind your child, say, look, I'm not your enemy. I'm your mother. I care about you. I'm on your side. I'm on your team. Sometimes I, I say that to my son. I say, I'm not your enemy, boy. I like calling him boy, but I mean, <laughs> I mean it in a joking manner. I don't know why I like that word. But anyway, I, I call him other nice names <laughs> as well. But anyway, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we're on the same team. Because a lot of times, you know, I, I can allow my husband to frustrate me. And I'll forget we're on the same team. And that's not good, but we want to remember that we're on the same team. And it really helps for a happy home, and it stops us from, from nitpicking our spouses and our family members. We're on the same team, so we want to encourage them. You know, just like you would a teammate. You want to encourage the person. We never tell another teammate, you're stupid, you're never going to make it. You know, you, you know, we don't do that, so we don't want to do that with our family either. We don't want to do that with our family. Finally, don't be afraid to seek family or marriage counseling if necessary. Mankind is naturally dysfunctional. That is why Father gives us his written word. Therefore, we should not be embarrassed to admit we need to get professional help. Just be careful whom you choose. I recommend seeing someone who is not affiliated with your congregation but who respects your Christian beliefs. And I shared the reason before is just for confidentiality reasons and, and, and plenty of other reasons, but... Just, just get someone that does respect your Christian beliefs. Like I just said, that, that is important. The, don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. I love that. I have that on my wall to remind myself that what's important to God is that I know him and my relationship with him. And so I, I, I put this passage in here because we need to realize that we need God. We, mankind, we need God. A lot of times we think we don't, or, or maybe more accurate, we just forget how much we need God and how, how frail and weak and dysfunctional we are. I don't know any family that's not dysfunctional, even in the Bible. The only, you know, the only thing is some of us may be a little less or more dysfunctional than others, but we're all dysfunctional. We all need Jesus or God when to sent him. And so it's wise for us to seek family counseling or help if the problem gets really bad. It's wise to do this, and a lot of times we don't. I don't know why, but we don't. We don't. A lot of us don't like going to the doctor. I don't either. But but we have to do what we have to do. We want the best for our families, and we're also setting a good example for our children to seek help when they need it. Because a lot of kids won't seek help even when they need it, and then they wind up their their family winds up falling apart, 
or their health problems. They won't go see a doctor or they won't take care of themselves just wherever. We just want to be that good example. Jesus said the sick need a physician. And so he, that's a principle. He's telling us, go to the doctor. If they can't help you, you know, then, then I can help you. You know, but God going to help us no matter what, if we're sick, you know, either before or after we go to the doctor. But the point is, we still need to see a doctor, you know, if we need to go. Some things we don't. God has given us natural remedies. And, you know, but sometimes we still need to go, especially if we, you know, for tra traumatic reasons. So anyway, the last sentence, ha having a happy home is not impossible. With God, all things are possible. And he wants us to be content and have a long, happy life. I never thought that my family life could be happy. My marriage and my son, I have a very small family and I did not think my family would, could be as happy as we are and my home could be so peaceful. But with God, all things are possible. When we follow the Holy Bible and we do what God says do in this powerful book right here, there's nothing God won't do and can't do in our lives. We just got to take the steps, you know, which may even include prayer just to help us take that first step. But this one, we follow the words in this book, man, there's nothing God can't do in our lives. And that's why my life is so blessed and I'm able to be here and to, and to share with you all uh, God-given insight and experience he's blessed in my life. And that's why. It's only because God has helped me and I have allowed God to help me, but he has given me his grace and mercy to, and favor, you know, to, 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 to even approach his throne to ask him for help. And that's what he has done. And so... Your house, your home can be happy. I don't care what, how bad your house home environment is now. It can be happy. I don't care if you're single, divorced, or a widow, or have no kids, or a bunch of kids, or wherever you live, you can have a peaceful, happy home environment. We all can when we follow God and his wisdom that Jesus left us in the Holy Bible. Page 83, Crossroad. This is Moment of Faith. I love Moment of Faith. This is, this was, this is to increase your faith. And we all need our faith increase. Our faith goes up and down like a roller coaster, sometimes higher up and higher down than others. But we all need a boost in our faith. This is why we have to read the Bible and pray on a daily basis. Crossroad. We all come to a crossroad in our lives and do not know which way to turn. However, when we remain faithful to God, he will show us the right way. I remember when I started my publishing company in 1998. Everything went well in the beginning, but a couple of years later, it hit a roadblock and everything came tumbling down. I eventually had to file for a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. At the same time, my marriage was on the rocks. To make matters worse, I got very ill and was on bed rest for months. That was a very scary and trying time for me. Before that point, I did not regularly handle crossroads or circumstances as Father instructs in His Word, even though at the time I professed to be a Christian. His word says, don't be afraid, but I was scared nearly to death and paralyzed with fear. His word says to trust in him, but I doubted him and his word for me. I even doubted that he loved me, although he had done so much for me my entire life and I had countless blessings. I finally learned to believe in his promises for me after he brought me through that life-threatening illness. That moment of realization literally brought me to my knees. Hidden in the closet in a fetal position, I howled in distress crying my heart out to him, and he delivered me. It took a while, and I had to practice patience, but he came through for me. Hallelujah. Just thinking about it now brings tears to my eyes. You may be standing at a crossroad in your life, too. Someone you love may be seriously ill. You may be confronted with losing your job or being laid off, or you may be tackling a divorce, extreme loneliness, or a financial crisis, or all of the above. But Father God wants you to know that he will gladly see you through if you let him. He wants the best for you and for you to be happy. However, he will not force his ways upon you because he is love and that is not his nature. He disciplines us as his children, but that does not make, but he does not make us do anything. So what do you want? So what do you do at the crossroad? How do you know which way to turn? The answer lies in God's word. When you earnestly pray, Study your Bible diligently, a minimum of three times a day, every day, and carefully obey it, confident that Father loves you and seeks your best. Things will turn around for you. Father turned them around for me when I was going through a storm, and he desires to do the same for all of his well-meaning children. There are times when our circumstances do not change. The world and its leader, Satan, lies to us and, and say we can have it all. 
We may be blessed to have more than we need, but no one has everything they want. Some people look at me and think that I have it all, but to the point of tears, I deeply desired another baby, and now I'm pretty sure that it is never going to happen. This doesn't mean I have lost hope. It means I focus on the bigger picture, and I've accepted my circumstances, and I'm grateful for the child I do have. Some people have none, so I count my blessings and get busy being a blessing to others, especially those in the church. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those He redeemed from the hand of the foe, those He gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He then led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Let the one who is wide heed these things and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord. I just love that passage. It just Psalm 107. It just reminds me that, that no matter what we're going through, how bad, even if it's at our own fault, which it usually is, that God still loves, loves us and he will still help us and deliver us. All we have to do is seek him. That's all we have to do. So I love that, that passage. That's one of my favorites. I read it on a regular basis and I encourage you to do the same. In summary, we humans reside in an evil world full of disappointments and profound grief. But that doesn't mean Father doesn't love us. In these situations, we need to cry our hearts out to Father, asking him to give us the courage wisdom, desire, and strength to be joyful, hopeful, and content, even during our trying times that may last a lifetime. He may not change the situation, but he can give us new lives and change our hearts and minds to the point that we barely notice our afflictions and burdens. And that is so true. So many times in my lives, in my life, God has, has not changed the situation, but he gave me uh, insight, better insight, where I was like, oh, okay, it's not as bad as I thought. You know, and so that's what God does. He changes us when we read the Bible and apply it to our lives. He changes our lives for the better. And I know in here I said, you know, read the Bible, read, study the Bible on page 83, diligently a minimum of three times a day every day and carefully obey it. And to study it every day, that's going to help you obey the word. The more we study the word of God, the more we want to obey and do what it says because the word of God is, according to Hebrews 4.12, it's living and active. It has power. So this one reason a lot of people don't like reading the Bible because they know it's going to change them. And sometimes they don't want to be changed. Sometimes we don't want to be changed. Okay, so that's why it's so important to read the Bible. And three times a day, I say three times a day because we, we eat three times a day. We eat more than that, most of us. But in general, we eat three times a day. So I think we should have our spiritual food three times a day. And it really will help. And even if it's just five minutes, even if it's, say, like uh, 15 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at lunch, and another 15 minutes before you go to bed, that's three times a day. That's barely 30 minutes. I'm sure we can give God at least half an hour a day in our lives, ladies. I know we can, ladies. I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to do that. And page 85 is inspiring proverbs and quotes. Inspiring proverbs and quotes. They're so beautiful. I encourage you to read them. I'll read them a uh, third one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Isn't God good? That's the God we serve. God is beautiful. And we do well to focus on God's goodness, not just his punishment or his justice. We all need God's love and we're all definitely going to need God's mercy on Judgment Day. All of us, I don't care how righteous we are or how far we've come, we all are going to need God's mercy on Judgment Day. We all are, including myself. Okay, page 86, how to find and wed a godly man. How to find and wed a godly man. I did an in-depth study on this. Uh, so it's available on my website if you want the uh, uh, DVD version. It's available on my website. It's also titled... Uh, it's also titled... Uh, uh, Single ladies get your husband. It's also tied there if you want if you want to see it on my channel. Okay, ladies. So how to find a way to godly man? <clears throat> 
Marriage is honorable among all, Hebrews 13, 4. First steps toward finding and wedding a godly man. Being single is a blessing and so is being married. Many single women desire to be married and according to the word of God, before we build a family, we should get married. But many times that is easier said than done. Following are some tips to help those who desire to be married snag not only a good man, but more important, importantly, a godly man. What's the difference? A good man may provide for you, but a godly man will not only take care of his family, he respects himself, is faithful to God, goes to church, and is going to help you get into heaven. This type of man makes a good and strong leader for his family. Before you begin your search for a godly man to marry, here is some solid advice. Pray about it. Right, ladies, of course. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 Sincerely ask, ask that God's will be done, not yours. Keep in mind that, like the Apostle Paul, everyone is not created or cut out to be married. Quote to 1 Corinthians 7.7 7. And so I encourage you, I encourage you, if you want to be married, if you're single, or even if you are married, I encourage you to study uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's a lot about marriage and relationships in there. It's very, very good study. Very good study. Uh, top of page 87, examine yourself. Know your qualities and what you have to offer to the relationship. They may include physical, mental, and spiritual abilities, such as being a good cook and homemaker, having a gentle and quiet spirit, having a loving, caring personality, and being well-organized, encouraging, intelligent, and godly. Also ask yourself if you really desire a husband. Being married is serious business, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 28. Everyone thinks that, that well, I won't say everyone thinks, but in general, a lot of people think that everyone should get married, but... Everyone is not cut out to be married. And everybody don't want to be married. Everyone also does not want to have sex. You know, and so we just need to be cognizant of these type of things and not put everybody in a box, including ourselves. Make a list of what you value most in a mate and write down what you will not tolerate. Keep in mind there are no perfect people. All of us have some type of shortcoming that we will most likely have to struggle with all of our lives. It's no perfect people. No, no one is flawless. We're called to be perfect, according to Matthew five forty eight. But that is a goal that we will always be attaining. We will always be striving for, as Christians and godly women. So, we have to. It's, it's wise for us to know what we want and what we don't want, and to make and some things that we definitely won't tolerate, like being disrespected. Be prepared. Keep your appearance up. Stay fit. Looks are not everything, but nearly every man, if not all men, want an attractive woman or one who looks her best. One who looks, their be looks her best. This book provides tons of information to help us to do just that. And I'm going to be covering that in some future le lessons when we get outside of and when we finish with Lovely Spirit, the uh, Lovely Spirit section. Be hopeful and optimistic, carefree and adventurous. In general, men prefer this type of woman. Nobody wants to be around a negative person, so men are no different. <clears throat> Where are the godly men? Where are the godly men? Before we can wear the godly man, we have to meet one. Therefore, I will now share, share good places to locate them. Remember to start a search when you are young, if possible. Many women who wait until they are in their 30s or older to marry have the hardest time because most men in that age group are usually already engaged or married. So I also did a lesson on this, I believe, uh, Boyfriends Dating and Sex that talks about getting married and things like that. So I encourage you, if you're single and you want to get married, or if you're young, you're a teenager, I encourage you to watch that lesson. It's a very serious study on boyfriends, dating, and sex, and marriage, as well as marriage, and how to prepare and get ready for that. I encourage you to, to view that. It's here on my YouTube channel. Okay, here are a list of places where godly men have been able to find, where godly women have been able to find a mate ideal for them. Before I get into it, I just want to say I know I know many people believe, including myself, that if you follow God and do what God says do, that he will lead a godly man to you. And I believe that. I really believe that. But sometimes, you know, we can also make ourselves accessible. And that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying, you know, because if you're, you know, if you're sitting in your house all the time and you never leave your home, 
it's going to be hard to find someone. I know now with social media and all those different type of things, you know, they, they may, might make it a little bit easier. I'm not really 100% sure about that, but they might make it a little bit easier. But we still have to do something. That's all I'm really saying. We have to do something. You know, I believe that God put me and my husband together, but I had to leave the house. I had to give my husband a chance. You know, I had to, when he called me, I had to call him back. You know what I'm saying? So there are some things we have to do. And so that's pretty much kind of what I'm saying. Okay. But it is better. Our chances are greater when we uh, seek first uh, God and his kingdom and his righteousness, according to Matthew 6, 33. Okay. Okay, so a list of places where godly women have been able to find a mate ideal for marriage. Church campaigns, conferences, gospel meetings, and lectureships. Many evangelists, preachers, and teachers frequently attend these type of events. Usually so, so do those who have, who have a love of God and make him a priority in this life. I put this first on this list because ideally it is best to marry someone with whom we share the same faith. According to 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 15. Okay, so there's our places if you want to meet a godly man. Of course, you're not, you know, it's going to be really, really hard to meet a godly man in a bar or a nightclub. And so you want to uh, put yourself in places where these type of men frequent. And that's where they go. Church, church events, events of the church. And not just the ones at your congregation, but I mean at other congregations uh, also throughout the country. I live in the United States. There's a lot of events, man, on the uh, in the south, east, west, just all over the United States. And that's what I'm saying. Get out there. Get involved. Even, you know, there's other things that you could do. So I'm going to cover some more right here. Page 88. Other congregations within and outside your city limits and state. Learn to look outside the box when seeking a mate. The ideal mate does not necessarily have to be a member at your congregation or live in your town. A lot of times we get stuck. We're like, oh, there's no one at my church. My congregation I guess I'm never going to get married. No, go. Go visit places. Go. If you're single, go. Go. Go go get involved. Do some things. Got to go. Go get involved. You don't have to stay inside that box. Christian online dating sites. This would not be my first choice or recommendation due to the fact that the Internet is filled with con artists. However, nowadays more and more people prefer to surf, prefer to surf the internet, internet than to hang out in public places. I met a married couple not too long ago at a church in Indiana who met via a Christian website. They were elated about it and informed me when I first met them. They were very excited. In the military, there are many young and available men in the service. Many are not in a relationship and are not married, so it may benefit you in finding a mate to to visit or see part-time work at a military installation. My husband worked in the military when I met when I first met him. He searched for, for female companion off base due to a lack of women where he was stationed. So the military is great and then the men, they're young. They're young and that's really the best time to get married when you're young. When you're young, when you're young, you wait till you're 30 and something. Like I said earlier, the uh, your pool of available men are, are going to be married or divorced. They have a bunch of kids. And so, in general, in general, speaking in general, the library, good and godly men like women are regularly, regularly into self-improvement. Normally, that type of person loves to read. Therefore, a great place to find them is at a library. And, and people who read in general, they're probably going to want to read the Bible, too. And so those are good people because they're into self-improvement. And that's what you want, like I just said. That's what you want if you want to be married. Everybody wants someone into self-improvement. That's the thing I love about my husband is he's always doing something. You know, he'll either lift weights and right now he's going to Bible college. and and But he's always been, you know, doing something to improve himself in some way, shape, or form. And it's encouraging and attractive. Family reunions. Many family members bring friends with them to their family reunions. You never know. You never know. Sporting events. Many men love sports and sport events are one of their favorite places to hang out. Business networks. Chamber of Commerce. These type of places are full of men. Many of them own their own corporations or are CEOs. As you all know, I have my own business. I started my publishing company in 1997. 1997 slash 98, right somewhere right around there. And so with my business, I hung out at the, uh, I hung out at the, uh, uh, I had to do a lot of business networking. So I hung out at chamber of conferences, things like, uh, 
oh, what was it called? First Fridays, all kinds of different things like that. Boy, I mean, it was men there, and I'm talking about single men. Single men in their 20s and early 30s, very handsome. And they were always, you know, they were always, are you married? Are you married? And I was like, yeah, I'm married. But a lot of those, those were good men, and they were looking for a woman. Man, talk about someone, you know, to invite to church to share the gospel with, you know. But I'm just saying that's where they're at. And sporting events, like I said earlier, you know, but nowadays, especially the fact that I recommend uh, online dating sites, you got to do your uh, research and background, background searches, you know, of course, we don't, we don't want to break anyone's, you know, privacy, intrude on anyone's privacy, but especially if you're dating online, you want to be careful. You want to be careful. We all have heard these horror stories of people that met someone on the internet and how it just turned out to be terrible, whether the dating or whatever. So we want to be careful. We, we want to we want to be careful uh, when we're out there uh, dating and and we want to do background checks. Uh, if they have a, a, a Facebook page or a, a Facebook profile, follow them and see what's going on before you commit or you know what I'm saying to get serious about this person okay that's what you want that's what we want to do ladies that's what we want to do so we just want to be careful you know it's, it's, I won't say I don't want to say just in this day and age because it's always been dangerous but especially if you meet these people on the internet you never really get to know these people we want to be careful okay ladies how to get him to marry you most women are aware that many men are, are afraid to commit. A few of the reasons men are fearful of marriage may are uh, fearful of marriage are due to lack of trust in God, fear of monogamy, and their inability to remain faithful. Here are a few tips to get him to pop the question. First, make sure he is ready to commit. The place to learn this is during the courting or dating process. Don't be afraid to ask him or to let him know you desire to marry. If he does not ask you, then ask him. There was a time when a man was required to approach the woman he was interested in and even to ask her or her family for her hand in marriage. But in the United States and many parts of the world, those days are gone. Nowadays, women are expected to approach the man. I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like that, but that's uh, this, for this, this world has changed, especially America. It's just not the same. I don't, I don't really understand it. I, don't, I ain't going to necessarily say it's wrong, but I don't like it. But it is what, is it, what it is. And so I guess the women have to adapt, you know. But I really believe, I, I believe in general that if a man really, really wants to, to be with a woman, he'll approach her. I really believe that. I, though married 30 years ago, 36 now, 30, 30 years ago, asked my husband to marry me, but it was not a traditional proposal. Basically, what happened was he was in the military, we were living together, and he unexpectedly received orders to go overseas. Well, I, being very young and impulsive at the time, simply said, marry me and take me with you. And the rest is history. At the time, I did not know anything about being a wife or getting married. I truly believe it was from the Lord and God's plan for us. I really do. And now that I look back, I jokingly and I tell my husband, I joke about it, but I really mean it. I really mean it. I tell him, I say, you know, you're supposed to, I, I tell him, I say, you should have married me anyway. Because my husband, neither one of us was raised in the church. Well, he, he kind of was. He was raised in the Baptist church. I wasn't raised in church at all. So I didn't really know anything about getting married. My mother never even said anything, even when me and him moved in together. She didn't criticize me, try to prevent it or nothing. So, But, uh, but I jokingly, I tell my husband, I say, you should have married me. You knew you should have married me. You were a Baptist. You was raised in church. You knew better. You wasn't right. And so I tell him, I say, you should marry me anyway. You should have been asking me. You shouldn't even moved in with me. You shouldn't even been shacking up. You know, I joke, I jokingly, I tell him those type of things now, you know, but, but, uh, I'm glad that him, him and I got married. I'm glad we got married. And at the time we did. And even though I don't want to kind of ask him, I, he still should have been the one asking me, but I don't regret suggesting that he marry me. I don't regret it at all because it doesn't matter. It got done, and that was 36 years ago. And my husband's kind of—he's kind of on a quiet—he's not—he's kind of on a quiet side, but he's not—he's not really assertive as I am. I'm very assertive, and he isn't. But he told me he, he told me so. I was going to ask you to marry me a few years later, and I'm like, no, but you were shacking up. And you, we were fornicating, and that's not Bible. 
<laughs> so anyway, I'm just saying, I just want to say that anyway. I just want to say that, but uh, anyway, so get married, ladies. Get married. Get God's blessings on your life. I talked about this before in my in my study on uh, dating, boyfriends, dating, sex, and marriage. I talk about this. Get married. Have God's blessings on your life. These women, I mean, I don't want to say these women, but a lot of women today, it's like, well, I don't want to get married. He don't want to get married. No, 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 no. Get married. It's so much better. And you have God's blessings. And tomorrow's not promised to any of us. And we want to be under God's umbrella, grace umbrella, you know. And marriage is one step in that, in the right direction. So page 89 toward the bottom here. A few more tips to get him to seek your hand in marriage. Stay busy. Have you noticed that when you are looking for something, it is hard to find, but when you are not looking, you happen upon it? For instance, when I met my husband looking for a boyfriend or someone to date was literally the last thing on my mind. I was busy trying to finish school and learn about myself, but today we have been together for over 30 years. I think part of what made him desire me was that I was not pursuing him, but busy thinking about other things and had my own life. And it's true, I, I did. Even then, my husband had chased me for like three months. Three months, I just kept giving. I didn't deliberately give him a hard time. I just wasn't ready. But the point is, I was busy. I was busy. It seemed like that's a principle in life. Like I just said, it's like when you're not looking for something or when you give up looking and you just say, oh, well, if it's meant to be, it'll be. It seemed like that's when the person come along. I think I think some people just 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 try too hard to pursue a man. And it's like and then they get frustrated. Live your life. Live your life. And I'm, I'm going to sh share with you some other things, but live your life. And if it's meant to be, it will be. And start counting your blessings and enjoying your life, enjoying your life. Whatever you do, do not be pressured into having, a premar having premarital sex. Once a person does this, it has an extremely strong chance of causing mistrust before and during the entire marriage on both sides. Once trust is broken, it is almost impossible to get it back. And that's what surprises me, how people that are married and they uh, are cheating on their spouse and then the person they're cheating with marries them. It's like, don't you know they're going to do the same thing, the same thing to you? You know, and even if you if you're dating someone and, and they uh, cheat on you while you're dating, they're most likely not going to be faithful once, once you get married. And that's why premarital sex is so taboo. It's not good. And that's why that's one of the reasons God warns us against it. And that's why it just causes more trouble. We don't see it, but it is. It, it breaks the trust. It breaks the trust when people are not faithful. It's just, it's just something always in the back of our mind. Even if we marry a person that's not a virgin, we know this person has slept around before. So we know, okay, if they did it once, they could do it again, even if I wasn't in the picture. You know what I'm saying? Even if you're not in the picture. So I know there's not, any, not too many virgins out there today, especially men, but we still have to think about these things. We want to be prayerful. God can turn anything into our favor. I wasn't a virgin, neither was my husband. And we have problems because of it, but my point is that God can still turn that into something good, but we have to commit our lives to him, and he will. He will. The bottom of page 89, be mindful that the same thing it took to catch him is the same thing it would take to keep him. So keep your appearance up, remain hopeful, and keep a positive outlook on life and love. Avoid depression and being moody, especially while dating or while engaged. Don't be too independent. Let him know he is needed. Men want to be the knight and shining armor in our lives. And I think even I was dating my husband that I was always asking him to do something for me. He, I, he knew I needed him. I made him feel needed because I did. I did need him. So a lot of times the women today, we, we can be just too independent. And we like it's like we want to exude this confidence that we don't need anyone. That's not good. That's not good because we, in reality, we all need someone. Of course, God is the ultimate. You know, it's God plus us is the majority. I understand all of that. I understand we don't need anybody's approval, but God, I understand all that, and I'm, I'm all for that. But men can get, men, men want, God created men to be needed by us, to provide for us. So if we take away that, that natural tendency that God put in them to be the provider, then you know what I'm trying to say? We're, we're, we're kind of making it harder. We're making it harder. 
So don't be too independent. And if you are very independent, just don't post about it. Don't be, I don't need you. And men don't need to, <laughs> men don't need to hear. It's not going to help if you're trying. Basically, all I'm saying is it's not going to help if you are trying to, trying to uh, be married. Stay sweet as honey. This will keep him attracted to you like honey to a bee, even after you're married. That's not in there, but I threw that in there. <laughs> I threw that. I threw that in there. Okay, ladies. Okay, so so page 90. We're on page 90 now, Mr. Right. If we can only find Mr. Right, we will be forever happy and satisfied. That is a true statement. But only when one knows Mr. Right is Jesus. He, Jesus, God in the flesh, is the only one who is able to truly complete fulfill and satisfy us. Those of us who are single may think that getting married is going to solve all of our problems, but the Bible plainly states that being married brings troubles, not removes them. Then those of us who are married may be may also be disillusioned. We expect or thought our husband would fulfill and satisfy us completely. We had no idea that one can still be lonely even while married. I experienced that. I have been married for a long time. My husband is not perfect and never has been. No, no, nor will be. Neither am I. God finally opened my eyes to the reality that there is no Mr. Right or a perfect person. So I've learned. So I have learned that it is wiser to be humble and to be a and to forgive and be a forgiving person. My marriage has been a hard struggle through the years. I know what it is like to be single because my husband and I have been separated on several occasions. My wanting him to be perfect led me to waste valuable time looking for Mr. Right. The truth is, we may think there may be a perfect man for us, but in fact, there is no one perfect man besides Jesus. I know there are very few godly men on this planet, and how many of them find it hard to commit to one woman. I have sympathy for women in these cases, but I also believe that with God, all things are possible. So whether you are married or single, remember that no one person can or ever will be able to fulfill or satisfy you or make you happy. So it is best to be content and happy now as you are. We were designed to need God in our lives. Only he can fulfill the void in our hearts and satisfy us completely. So the only Mr. Right is God or Jesus. According to the Bible, he can and desires to fulfill and satisfy us. And he will if we let him. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16, 11. Psalm 16, 11. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. That's beautiful, ladies. A husband from heaven. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Psalm 37, 4. I believe that when we delight ourselves in God and his word that all things are possible. Well, that is what God's word says, right? Right? Psalm 37, 4, Matthew 19, 26. But some say, God is not going to drop a man out of the sky for you. Yes, this may be true in general, but I believe it is possible. What I'm saying is that just because we may not see it does not necessarily mean it won't arrive. Remember, Jesus and the fish. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on the mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. It's Matthew 15:29 uh, through 39 NIV. If someone attends a church and is looking for a mate to marry and desires to stay within their congregation, which is the pre preferential thing to do, but there are no available men there to marry, who says God can't bring one there or in, our li in their lives? To not think so, I believe, is the lack of faith and trust in God. We should never put limits on God. Jesus said, in order to receive, we must first believe we have already received. I know this may sound like asking too much for many, but I believe it truly is a matter of faith. Hebrews 11.6 For instance, when I got married 30, 
30 years ago, 36, my husband did fall from the sky. I said that because I was not looking for a husband and truly did not even desire one at the time. But I needed one, and I have one due to God's grace. So God, not I, deserve all the credit. To me, in hindsight, he basically sent me a husband from heaven. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Matthew 19:26. If you are seeking a mate to marry, and that is an honorable thing to do, delight yourself in the Lord, cheerfully and wholeheartedly seek Him, feel His word, and feel obedience, and He will give you the desires of your heart. If it is meant to be, it will be, unless Father has other plans for you. So, believe. So, so that's what we're supposed to do, ladies. If you are single and you want to be married, if it's meant to be, it will be. I, I can only think of a few reasons why God would not send a husband, the person uh, you know, because God is all seeing and all knowing. So he would probably say, oh, if I give this person a husband, uh, you know, it just it may make her, it turn may turn her heart away from me because that does happen. And so we don't know. But also at the same time, we can't blame God. And I really want to say that 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 we can't blame God in our society that we live in today, especially in America. There's uh, uh, the pool of available men to marry is 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 a challenge. It's very challenging for women, and I see this is is for all races of women, but especially for African American women. According to statistics, an African American woman will have a 60% chance or harder of or, or of getting married, and that's because of of, of a lot of the men, uh, young black men or black men are are in jail or dead, or just don't want to get married or probably already, you know, instead of getting married, a lot of them have women and they have uh, uh, already have a bunch of kids. And so they have a lot of obstacles, you know, that's preventing them from marriage. And then a lot of people today don't want to get married. They just rather shack up. So that decreases the chances of a woman getting married, especially African-American women. And that's why I encourage women to get married younger. I really believe that's one reason that I, I, I was able to get married is because I got married young. But society today tells people to wait, to wait, to wait till they're, you know, older. And it's like, while you're waiting, someone else is getting your husband. I don't want to be depressing or sound negative, but come on, think about it. Just think about it. If, if, if the ratio to men to women was exactly the same all through life, there would be not, there, would, there wouldn't be a less chance of women getting married. There would be a greater chance doesn't mean there will, there will be a greater pool of, of godly men, but it will still be more men. I remember visiting the Philippines many, many years ago. This was when my husband was in the military. We went to the Philippines uh, near the military base out there, the Air Force base. I, I believe it was in Angeles City. And man, I could not believe, even today, and it may be worse. I'm not really sure. I haven't been there. This was over 30 years ago. But I could not believe the, the few men over there. I, I was in the world, wasn't raised in the church. Me and my husband used to go clubbing. We used to go to nightclubs and drink and all that party. And I remember going to this one club over there in the Philippines, and there wasn't any men there. It was just women. I mean, it was like 99% women. And they were all dancing with each other because there were no men. I, I can't, I don't really know why it was like that. I don't know. Some of you may know you can comment if you want. I never really asked the women in the Philippines or asked anyone why it was like that. I think they said because it, there had been a war or something. I can't remember, but man, what do you think those women chances are of getting married when there's no men and that's not God's will. It wasn't, it's not because God don't want them to get married. Where's the men? You know, so that's why I said, if it's really, really meant for you to get married, God's going to get you a husband. He's going to get you. I don't care if there's ain't no man around. God's going to get you a husband there somehow. I believe that. And as Christians and godly women, we are called to walk by faith, not by sight. So God's going to get you a husband. But at the same time, you know, we live in an evil, fallen world. And we bring mankind, we bring all this negative stuff on ourselves. And so then, you know what I'm saying? So that's all I want to say. Uh, you know, I'm not saying you won't ever be able to get married or nothing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I'm just trying to keep it real. So got to keep it real. You know, so 
So anyway, ladies, so that's lesson 10. That's lesson 10, ladies. So next week, we're going to do lesson 11 next week. We're going to do lesson 11. We're going to start out on page 93 next week. We're going to start out on page 93, ladies. Okay, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Even when this, this premiere is over with, you can comment below. I always read all my comments, and I always reply. Okay, ladies, so I hope you have enjoyed this study, and I hope this has, has been a blessing to you. So God bless you and keep you, and join me next week. God bless you. See you later. Bye-bye.